else you want is there. It's coming. And my, this brother has done that very well. He, he ministers to the leadership of the largest uh, and oldest underground network of churches in China. He says when he's there, he's the, probably the only one that hasn't been in prison for his faith. When he's ministering to these people, he says, I don't know why they ha- have me come. He, uh, he's also overseen a group of prophetic people in America. He's had a direct line to the Pentagon, and if they hear anything coming from the Lord, I don't know if they're doing this actively, but he did it for about 20 years. He had the right to call our government officials and say, these people are hearing something from the Lord, and, uh, and give them what they gave him. I mean, I don't, most of you didn't know there's anything like that in America. For a while, we had psychics, because Russia had psychics. Their psychics seemed to work, but our psychics, <laughs> they weren't any good. So Don heard that, and he said, you know, psychics are just an imitation of the real thing. There's prophets that God has in the land. And so they put him over this group. And some of you wouldn't know some of the names of the men that he was, he was working with. But anyway, he, so he's worked in government stuff. He's worked in... Uh, intelligence with Israel and America, he's <laughs> all kinds of stuff. And I've gone to Russia and Mexico with him, and he carries a powerful anointing, and I think he's wanting to get back to that, hosting the presence of the Lord. That seems to be his primary primary thing. I had, it, no, it's, it's not hype, it's not, you know, it's just, he's just a really down-to-earth guy. You would, he's the, maybe one of the most influential men in America that nobody ever knows, <laughs> that nobody knows. <laughs> But you're going to get to have him here in six weeks. He's going to be here. He's going to be in southern Illinois for the whole week and speaking at different churches and different places. And uh, so uh, he's going to be here. That's my second announcement. I think I had a third one. I was just going to say this, uh, the COVID thing and all this that's going on. In, uh, I think the last time we had a prayer meeting in Whittington, Illinois, Ray came, and that night I just shared with him. I said, there has just been this chapter that has just been on me. I can't shake it. And it's Isaiah 26, and there was th- a couple of different verses there. Verse 3, it says, The steadfast of mind thou wilt keep in perfect peace, because he trusts in thee. Many of you know he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Right? You've heard that. Some of you have heard that. We had songs about it in old scripture song days and things like that. Well, you know, I didn't know what this was about, but, you know, we've got to staying in perfect peace if our minds are kept on the Lord because we, because what? We trust him. Because we trust him. We will be in perfect peace if our mind is stayed on him because we trust him. And I went down to verse 9. It says, at night my soul longs for thee. And immediately I thought, well, in the dark place. In the dark place, all of a sudden we long for the Lord. And we're hearing that now. We're hearing from, from, uh, uh, from Morocco that there's just a, a large inquiry for Bibles right now during this time. We're hearing in Afghanistan that some of the workers there, the Christians, they decided not to hide, but they, they, made, they started making masks. They took the masks to their neighbors. Then they found out the hospitals didn't have masks, so they'd taken masks to the hospitals, to the doctors and the nurses, and they're winning people to Jesus in Afghanistan. There's an awakening in Afghanistan, awakening in Iran. There's, I mean, there's awakening in the Muslim world right now. And we'll talk about some of the dreams and things people have had as we go along and stuff like that. Some people that we've met that, you know, that the Lord was working on. And then it says, indeed, my spirit within me seeks thee diligently. At night, in the dar- I thought, in the dark place. Okay, when darkness seems to come, all of a sudden we get serious with God, right? Yeah. Our world is shaken up. And it's like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. You know, we're pretty, we're, we may be insincere in our general, I mean, that might be a, a pretty weak prayer because it's just a reactionary prayer. But it does bring us to call upon him. And it goes on to say that in the rest of the verse. For when the earth experiences thy judgments, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. Though the wicked is shown favor, he does not learn righteousness. He deals unjustly in the land of uprightness and does not perceive the majesty of the Lord. There is an uprooting that's happening in America right now. You know what? That's not easy. I was out cutting this tree that died out in front of our house. It was a it had a lot of different branches. It was kind of a decorate ornament tree kind of thing. And I cut off all the branches, and I think, I would really like to put something else here. And then I looked at the root system. I thought, this is going to take weeks to get this thing out of there, especially at the pace I work now. <laughs> but, you know, and I, start, and I thought immediately of America right now. You know, what's going on is, is there is a, there's a, I mean, everyone is hearing reset, right? Did you hear reset? I mean, it's like, that's so obvious. When we got into this thing, everyone's, everything's shut down. We're in a reset mode. You're resetting your priorities. 
But I think what's happening in a larger scale is there's a reset that's happening personally, but there's a reset that's happening in the media. We're going to start seeing different media sources come up. There's reset happening in education. Right? There's going to be different options coming up, and, and Christians are rising up. Some Christians are beginning to rise up and say, we need to do something about education. They're offering. Because, but, you know, in order to get that to happen, those roots got to get dug out. And that is no easy thing. That is a mess. It's difficult. You know, pastor said he believes a revival is coming, but it'll be a, the, there's a cost. Well, there is a cost. There's a cost in all of this. And uh, so... Uh, anyway, I think government, there's going to be a reset. How many of you know that's, that's a tough thing to dig out? That's, a, you know, that's a, some deep roots there. The whole system that we're involved in, and it's got to be uprooted. This isn't a time just to say, oh, Jesus, come, 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 get me out of this mess. You know, if he comes, great. I like that idea. I'm looking forward to the, the glorious hope of our, the blessed hope of our the return of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I say some days, Lord, come. You know, part of, the, part of the reason for darkness on the earth is that by the end of the book, if you've read this book, by the end of the book, it says the spirit and the, Lord, and the, church, and the bride, the spirit and the bride say, come. Well, what happens when the bride finally gets, well, you know, this world does not satisfy me anymore. I'm not tied into it because, you know, Lord, don't disrupt my schedule. Well, all of a sudden our schedule's disrupted. Things are getting different. We say, Lord, come. You know, he's setting it up. He's setting us up. He's giving us a good opportunity to respond to him. And so, uh, and then the next, going on in this verse, uh, chapter, kind of a strange thing, in verse 20, it says, Come, my people, enter into your rooms. This was right when they started the lockdown. I was, I was stuck on this chapter, and all of a sudden, I'm reading this verse, enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until indignation runs its course. For behold, the Lord is about to come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, and the earth will reveal her bloodshed and will no longer cover her slain. There are going to be things that start to be revealed right now about bloodshed and things that have happened and, and horrific things that have happened that are going to start to be revealed right now. This will be messy. That's why we need the 100 days of prayer. <laughs> That's one of the reasons. I mean, okay? I think I'm done with my announcements, maybe. Okay. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to share with your saints in Robinson, Illinois. Lord, to share with these that you count precious in your eyes. And Lord, you know them. You know their struggles. But Lord, your heart is toward them. And Lord, I just pray that you'd give them a heart for you, Lord, that they would come to a place of full surrender because they trust in you. And so today, Lord, I pray that the trust, uh, our trust in you would grow from maybe some of the testimonies we hear and from your word. Your, our trust would grow that you are faithful. We can really depend on you, Jesus. And so bring us to that place in honesty, in the, in the secret places of our hearts, not just when we're in church, but, Lord, when we're at home and, and fear or worry begins to overwhelm us. Lord, bring us to that place, Lord, where we just begin to trust you more. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I heard somebody talking about, oh, learn a language. Go see this, brother. Amen. Learning another language is so valuable. You know, I looked up here and I said, said to Anita, says, well, the first six flags on that side, we had someone in our church in Marrakesh, you know, at some point from those first six flags on this side. And then we had Philippines and in Tangier, we had Norway and South Korea. We had Canada. You know, you go to places and all of a sudden, but I don't see a Moroccan flag. Where's the, what's the deal here? Man, that's really disappointing. <laughs> But anyway, the, uh, learn a language, any language. Absolutely. I know one phrase in Moroccan Arabic, which Moroccan Arabic is different than all the Arabic of the rest of the world. If you learn a Moroccan Arabic, you can only speak it in Morocco. Nobody else will understand you. And the only thing I really learned in a sentence was, Richard, can you say it yet? I've said it to you twice. <laughs> Makent Sherib Kahwa is, I don't drink coffee. Because <laughs> it's a coffee society, and I don't drink coffee like people thought, you can't even be a Christian there and not drink coffee. But I didn't, so I learned the phrase. But can't share Kahua. 
There's seven consonants in a row. And that was one. I mean, learn a language, though. It's valuable. French, Spanish, something. Arabic. Because God's doing something in the Arab world. And I heard someone talking about uh, the call, the call. The call God has on each one of us. God has a plan in our lives that he's executing with our knowledge or in spite of our knowledge sometimes. He's still doing something in us, and we can be clueless. We don't even know what he's doing. Uh, and I want to share it, kind of introduce the whole thing to our trip to Morocco, and we'll, we'll look at how we got there and stuff like that. But um, I'm going to start with a, something that happened to me when I went to Kenya f- several years ago. I went the first year I went, and, and uh, my friend Titus, some of you have met Titus, he said, I want you to speak at our first annual conference, Easter conference. And they didn't know how to do a conference, so I spoke for 30 hours in five days. I was worn out. I remember one time they were, I thought, you know, it was getting around noontime, and they were, we were going to eat lunch, and a lady sticks her head in and says, take another hour. <laughs> so on the spot, I have to speak for another hour. So 30 hours, so given that, I come home totally worn out, probably one of the most fatiguing things I've ever done in my life, because I just flew there, I was still in jet lag, and they said, Pastor Ed, I just want you to speak, and I'm like, uh, you know. And so the next year, he calls me back again, says, I want you to come back again. I said, listen, do you just want the money, you know, uh, for the trip, I can send you the money instead of coming. No, no, you don't understand, you need to come, and I want you to speak on breaking the spirit of poverty. And I thought, breaking the spirit of poverty, I don't have, do I have to do 30 hours again? 30 hours, on, I don't, Maybe a half an hour. I, I don't know. I mean, I was just like desperate. So we're, we go to South Carolina to our son's house, and we're, we're driving back. It's, it's uh, March 1st, and I'm going there on March 30th. And so I got 30 days. And we're driving, and I would like to he- tell you, I heard an angel say, pull off here, and I will speak to you. But actually, I was kind of irritated. It was kind of rainy, and you know, I was hungry, and it's just like, well, let's get off the road. And she thought, there's a Cracker Barrel. Let's go to the Cracker Barrel. So we go to the Cracker Barrel, and we see you here. Smith, party of four. I'm thinking, I'm not waiting here. We're traveling. So we travel. We go to the next little stop. It's Quiznos right next door to them. We go in. Nobody's there. I go get my sandwich. She goes to the restroom. I go sit down. These two guys come in. They sit right next to me. Okay? The place is empty, but this guy's sitting. His shoulder's about touching mine, you know? He's sitting back here, and, and, and I'm, I'm listening to him, and he says, uh, I just got back from Nairobi, Kenya. I've been with a missionary that's a lifelong missionary, and he said, we're trying to solve a, a spiritual problem with a material answer. And he says, he's found, he's found stuff from the Word of God that really works, and he's written a booklet called Breaking the Spirit of Poverty. <laughs> and I say to her, can you hear him? And she was like, no, I had to be sitting that close to hear what this guy says. Well, he's, I, you know, when it's done, I tap him on the shoulder and say, hey, yeah, I'm going to Kenya. I'm supposed to teach on breaking the spirit of poverty in 30 days. And so he gets my address, sends copies of booklets, sends it to me. We start teaching it in Kenya. It really does a marvelous thing. Uh, people are really responding to it. Well, and I can't take any credit. You know, I didn't, I didn't do anything. I just went, I ate at Quiznos. <laughs> That was my big, that's why I said, sometimes God is working things in spite of us. We don't even know what he's doing. But if we're there, so fast forward, I'm in Morocco. I'm sitting at Dino's with Anita, my favorite place. They serve gelato. You know gelato, it's Italian ice cream. Oh, oh, Dino's is so good. So I'm sitting there, and I'm in one of my moods again. None of you have those, I'm pretty sure. Hope you don't. Well, I'm there, and I said, what in the world are we doing here? We can't even speak the language. It's useless being here. What in the world? Well, you know, that, that episode we had took place in Knoxville, Tennessee. So to us, that was the place of provision. God is going to take care of it. So I'm sitting there offering my wine, my wine offering before the Lord, whining to the Lord. <laughs> and, uh, and to her, but she could hear it. She was just there. So next thing you know, she taps my leg and, like, look up. Well, you know, we're sitting in kind of an outside area. There's a little hedge uh, of uh, shrubs, and then the sidewalk there. And there's a guy comes and stands, like, this far in front of me. There's my, me, the table, the shrubs, the sidewalk. 
And he's standing right there. She taps me on the leg and says, look up. And the guy on his shirt, it says, Knoxville. Well, Knoxville was the place where God provided that incredible gift of that message. And so I just said, okay, I get it. We're here. You know, we're not necessarily all that important other than we're here. You'll take care of it. And he does. You know, he, he takes care of it even when we don't know what in the world we're doing. You know, we were just there. I knew I was supposed to go there. So how did we get there? How did we get to Morocco? And I want to tell you a little bit about Morocco. I hope you're okay with this. hope you don't get bored. If your neighbor falls asleep, just tap them or give them a pillow if they're really, they might need to sleep. Uh, in 2000, well, probably somewhere around 2011, 10, something like that, we met a couple named Steve and Jennifer McMichael. And they had been missionaries in the Zambia. And they were changing. They felt called to the Muslim world. And so they were, they were going to learn their language. They were going to France to learn French so they could go to Morocco. And we met them, just connected with them. I thought, we're going to be in touch with these people the rest of our lives. I mean, I feel so close. Take it like four years later. Haven't heard from them, talked to them, anything. <laughs> I get a newsletter, and it's from Steve. And it says that uh, they are presently in Tangier, Morocco, if you don't know where Tangier, Morocco is, if you know the map of Africa, there's a point there where there's the Straits of Gibraltar. And if, you, if you're the very point, you can look across there about six or seven miles and see Spain. And that's Tangier. Tangier's right up there on the Mediterranean, right where the Mediterranean and the Atlantic meet. And so he's up there, and he says, we need someone to fill in for six months. And so we've been at Little Chapel in Harrisburg for like 20 years at that point. And so I, I go to the leadership and I say, I figured they're probably sick of me and, you know, they've heard everything I got to say. <laughs> so I just say, we would like to take maybe a sabbatical if we could. And if you could just, like, cover our health insurance, we're going to go to Tangier, Morocco. And say, no, we'll just we'll continue to pay you. Just go. And we decided to go for three months. We thought six was stretching it for the church and that kind of thing. So we went for three months. Uh, but the way it happened was we get the newsletter. And I'm reading the newsletter. And as I'm reading it, you know, he's looking for someone to come. Something just leaps in my heart. Mm -hmm. That's all I can say. Something leaps in my heart. I go home to Anita, and I tell her, I said, I think we're supposed to go to Morocco. What do you think? And she's basically, I'm all in. Well, our, our, uh, our history with Africa is this. We spent most of our time in Kenya, the place of mud huts. Some of our best friends live in mud huts. And we're thinking, okay, I don't know anything about Morocco. How many of you know anything about Morocco? I didn't know anything about Morocco at the time we're going. I'm thinking, maybe we're in a mud hut. I don't know. But something leaped in my heart, and I remember this verse in uh, Luke 24, 32. They, and they, these guys were walking on the road to Emmaus with Jesus. They said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And I thought... That's what happens. He still does that today. Does not our heart burn within us while he is speaking to us? While he is explaining the scriptures? Have you ever had something all of a sudden, wow, that scripture's really alive. Well, he's still speaking to us today, and sometimes we feel that in our heart. Well, Anita is the hero in this because I had at least a, a leap in my heart. She had me saying, I think we're supposed to go to Morocco. And uh, so I... I go back to this in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah has a vision. It says, In the year that King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. That's one big robe. I mean, the robe filled the temple. This is a, I mean, you got to get the sight. This is overwhelming, what Isaiah's seen. Seraphim stood above him, whatever they are, each having six wings, six wings, and, you know, Two, he covered his face, two, he covered his feet, and two, he flew. And you're seeing this. Can you imagine you're seeing this? You can't imagine, because if you imagined it, you, wouldn't, you couldn't sit there and look like this at me. <laughs> and one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out, while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips. lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. You know, he's implicating you. You know, it's like me saying, you know, my mouth is defiled, and I live a bunch of people that they're, they're got defiled mouths too. You, these people, they hear at Robinson in this church. 
you know, just think what I, Isaiah was doing talking about his buddies here. And it says, I live among those people. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew, etc. I'm going to go down to verse 8. It says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send, he said, send me. Here am I, send me. My question to you is, where? <laughs> he doesn't even know where yet. And that's why I look at Anita. You know, when I told her, we had no idea. We were thinking mud huts. When we got to Tangier, we lived on this beautiful apartment, top floor. You could see Spain across the Straits of Gibraltar. <laughs> we weren't suffering in our, in our accommodations. You know, I went down and went for a walk along the Mediterranean every morning, you know, or whatever. It, it was, we weren't suffering, but we didn't know. And before we knew, she was saying, here am I, send me. But what happened with Isaiah is he saw the Lord. When you see the Lord, when you really get a hold of, you get an understanding who he is. Maybe you see him like Isaiah. Not many people have done that. But maybe you get an understanding that Jesus was the only one in history that lived a perfect life. Not only could he qualify for heaven on the basis of his life, but he is the only one that ever lived that qualifies to be the sacrifice for sin because it had to be a perfect sacrifice. If he didn't die, we're lost. There's no hope because only one ever lived a life to qualify to be the sacrifice for sin, and it was Jesus. And when you get a view of that, all of a sudden, he says, I need to send somebody somewhere, and you say, here am I, send me, wherever. You want a personal revival? Here you're talking about revival. You want a personal revival? Here's the way I get it. Whenever I can honestly get down to this point and, and pray this, I say, Lord, I will go anywhere you want me to go. Because I think right away, I think South Sudan. I don't want to go there. <laughs> I mean, when I start thinking right away, Sudan, I don't want to go to Sudan. But I said, when I really get to a place of surrender, I say, Lord, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll say anything anything you want me to say to anybody you want me to say it to. And when I get to that point, I'm surrendered and I have revival. But I tell you what, those are testing statements. And when you can, if you can say those from your heart honestly, you've come to that place of surrender. And uh, so I just encourage you with that, that if you really want that personal revival... You can get it. You can get it pretty fast. You know, and the thing is, we found out when we say yes to the Lord, our time in Morocco was, when we went to Tangier, when I came back, I said, it was the best three months of my life. I just, it was so amazing. We saw, we met a lady from Norway. I'll tell you a little story about prayer. I was going to do this when we were announcing prayer. From Norway. Her name was Helen. And Helen, uh, Okay, Okay. We, we, were, we went to pastor an international church, which is uh, in Morocco. Moroccans aren't supposed to go to church, necessarily. Although it's up in the air, some places they say it's okay, some places they don't. They don't know right now. There's, they're, Morocco's in a transition. It's a Muslim world, a tourist country. They want tourists to keep coming, so they don't want to kick people out. But, uh, so they're, they're really sensitive. So what we have is we have people that are living in the country that are from other countries that speak English, and they come to our church. When we were in Marrakesh, we had mostly uh, university students from Nigeria and Ghana and immigrants from Liberia. And, uh, and I'm, I was going to get to that in a minute here. forgot where I was at now. Norway. Okay. So anyway, that's, that's the essence of the international church. Uh, and this lady from Norway, she's there. She's in the international church. She's teaching these young African to play the guitar and stuff. Sweet, sweet lady. Well, she's on the street, and a Moroccan girl asks her, can you get me a Bible? And this can be dangerous for the Moroccan girl. This could be dangerous for the person giving it to her. I mean, basically, if I got caught giving out Bibles, the worst that probably happened to me, I'd get kicked out of the country. Okay? But, you know, they can have a lot of persecution from that. So it's, it's somewhat risky. So she said, I'll do that. So she gets her a Bible, Gives her the Bible. The girl takes it home and hides it in her room. How many of you are mothers? You know mothers find everything? So her Bible's hidden in her room. The mother finds it. Has her come out to the <coughs> living room. <coughs> Excuse me. The living room. <coughs> Still choking. <coughs> and says, uh, 
I found this in your room. Lays the Bible out there in front of her. Says your father will deal with this when he gets home. Because he worked on the, during the week out and he was coming home for the weekend. So they get home. Mom, dad, the girl are all sitting in the table. Bible's laid out there. Dad doesn't say a word. Gets up, goes to the other room, comes back in the room, lays his Bible right next to hers. Amen. Said, we were afraid to tell you we were Christians. We didn't want to put you under the scrutiny of having to live with that, but we've been praying for you. Take heart, folks. Pray with fervency. Pray with faith. Pray believing that God is actually going to do something. Amen. So where am I? Well, we came back from Tangier to the United States, and we thought, I thought I'd be at Little Chapel for several years and stuff, but circumstances came along so that it became obvious we were supposed to go back to, Marrakech, or to, to Morocco. And we knew that Marrakesh was a church that needed a pastor. Never had a pastor, just brand new. We went and visited in 2016. There were nine people in the church. Uh, the pastor from Casablanca drove three hours. He'd go to church, and he'd have church in the morning. They'd rest. They'd drive three hours to Marrakesh with the worship team, have the service there, drive three hours back after that, get back at midnight. He's doing that every week. They didn't have a pastor in Marrakesh, so we feel like, I think we're supposed to go to Marrakesh. Well, the Lord made it real clear. I don't know if he's ever done this with you. Uh, it's like, okay, Ed, you can choose whatever choice you want. Here's the choice. <laughs> you can choose to go through this narrow place that I'm only giving you one real option. And, of course, yes, yes, Lord. But we really felt like, it was made real clear that that's what we were supposed to do. We didn't, yeah, when we, we visited in 2016, after we'd been in 2015, three months, we went back, visited. And when we got done, we thought, well, we'll probably be in Morocco sometime, but we didn't love it. It wasn't like, we've got to do this. Nothing like that, but all of a sudden, it became real evident. Uh, the Lord was giving us an opportunity that <laughs> it was like the only opportunity I had left. <laughs> Walk in this way. So it seemed like it was pretty clear that we should be going there. Uh, so in Marrakesh, <clears throat> city of about a million people, there's one Catholic church, they speak French in there. There's one French Protestant church. You know, this is a Muslim country. So the only buildings left are this Catholic church and this French Protestant church. And we rented then the French Protestant church building in the evening and had our services in the evening. And what we did is we opened it up to, to, to people that spoke English that were from other countries. That's why, you know, I, I've, I've ministered to hundreds of people from the Netherlands. Hundreds and hundreds, because they would visit Marrakesh on vacation. For some reason, it was a popular, and they'd come to church. We'd have groups of 30 and 50 come sometimes, but almost every week there was someone from the Netherlands. So I've spoken to a lot of people from the Netherlands. You know, it's just, we had a person in church from Haiti. I mean, it's just the opportunities that you have. It was, it was marvelous. It was wonderful, and it was difficult. So frustrated oftentimes about the language. Uh, we didn't have a car. You don't want to drive a car in Marrakesh anyway. It is crazy. <laughs> Give you an example. Cars pull up, turn left. Okay, I'm coming up, I'm a car, I'm going to turn left. I get up here, I turn like this. Another car comes, they get like here. Another car comes, they get like here. Another car comes, they get here. And when you can finally go, the car that's here is supposed to go first. If you don't know that, you're in trouble. I mean, it's a big crack up there with, you know, because the last one to come that's on the far end of the line goes first. And if you've got your nose in front of any other car, you've got the right of way. Uh, it's just, so who would want that anyway? But it was frustrating. It was difficult. It was wonderful. It was difficult. Anita and I had opportunities you can't imagine. And this was just by saying yes to the Lord. We did a wedding in the Sahara Desert. We rode camels for an hour out into the desert. Went to a desert camp, got a little rug. It was me and Anita, the couple, and the photographer. Five-person five camel train with Muhammad leading us in the front, you know, pulling us along. In fact, on the way out there, all of a sudden, Anita's camel starts wandering off. And she's like, hey, 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 hey. It broke loose, and I'm looking. All you can see is sand, you know, forever and ever. I mean, it's not like, how do you get around there? It's like, go to the sand dune and turn right. So we ride out there for an hour into the desert, come to this desert camp, get a little rug out. They take it up to the top of a sand dune. We do a wedding. 
Incredible. We rode the camels back that night, another hour, in the dark. No moon. Muhammad with his cell phone and his little flashlight, you know, leading the train. <laughs> and I hurt so bad. Anita and I hurt so bad. Those camels, those camel saddles do not have stirrups. There's nothing to hold you up. You, you are held up by that part in the middle of your body that's rotating on the thing going like this. <laughs> those young people, they were up there. They were like tying their shoes and stuff. I was holding on for dear life. And you're sliding down 10-foot sand dudes, and you're like this, and, the, and the, the camel behind me had his nose in my left pocket, you know, slobbering, and we're glad we did it. Will we do it again? No, we're not doing that again. <laughs> but the experience of a lifetime, I did, I did four, four weddings, three destination weddings. Well, and, you know, I wasn't legal to do weddings in Morocco, but they'd get married someplace else and come and do the ceremony there. A couple from the United States, a couple from Nigeria, and this couple from Romania. And just, you know, opportunities that, you know, the Lord just gave us things to, to bless us. Experiences that are unbelievable, but difficult. <laughs> difficult. Things are difficult. Uh, okay, so let's get ahead here. Uh, so in the church, because I, I did the international church thing early. In the church, we had students, most of, most of them on national scholarships. They were bright students from Ghana and Nigeria. A lot of really brilliant kids. And they were, they could go to, if you can get to Morocco, your education is free. If you can get, in, you know, get into the university there. And uh, so we had university students, and then we had basically uh, immigrants that were there. Most of them illegally from Liberia. Some of them were a little bit older. They fled the war there, the stories they told. Some of them came through the desert on the way there. They watched friends die in the desert. They watched people starve on the way to get to Morocco. And they said living with nothing in Morocco was better than living with nothing in Liberia. Liberia had 85% unemployment rate when we were in Morocco. And uh, you know, so it was some really tough times. And then something happened. We ran into four Filipino evangelists. Oh my, I tell you what, South Korea, God bless them. They're leading the way in evangel world evangelism right now, missions. They really are. And Phil the Filipino guys, these guys are amazing. And here's the amazing thing about them. They come to Morocco from Saudi Arabia. They get saved and on, set on fire in Saudi Arabia in the international church, Filipino national, international church in Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia doesn't know it. They're sending out missionaries to other Arab countries. These guys get there, and we're in this prayer meeting. And I tell you what, talk about prayer. God just gave us something in our hearts for Morocco. You know, when Jesus, and it says in Psalm 2 how the nations are raging and all of this. Well, in, there, in the middle of that, it says, Ask of me, and I will give the nations as an inheritance for you. And there's something that just came on me, and I said, Okay, Lord, you said that. You fulfill that then. I'm asking you for Morocco. So when all the folks from the Netherlands would come, I said, Everyone likes to be in on ground floor. I said, I'm going to give you a chance to be ground floor. Morocco one day is going to be known by the name of Jesus. you got a chance to start praying right now. You can be in on ground floor. You want to do that or you can just wait and say, oh, yeah, well, I heard that one time. What about working through it? What about praying for America, bringing uh, awakening, bringing the revival? Evolved? What about working through it? You know, and so uh, these guys were so fervent, so we're having prayer meetings with them. This is fun. Between the, our brother from Liberia, man, when he prays, I just, I just sat back and just kind of took it all in. And these, these guys from the Philippines, well, we're in this first meeting with these guys, really, these Philippine evangelists. They're going around the country. They're blatant. They're just going sharing the gospel. And then they write down the names, and, and they try and follow up on them. They've got to move from place to place because they're being followed by the police every now and then. So this brother says to me, he says, Pastor Ed, I came to Morocco. I got persecuted. He said, I think we should tell Christians. I think they'll come. He thought that every Christian would want to be persecuted for Jesus' name. He said, who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want that? Talk about a challenge to our souls and to our commitment and to our lifestyle. They, they would always say, uh, they'd come in the room and say, Matthew 24, 14. This gospel of the kingdom must be preached to all the earth and then the end will come. Or they would say, the Great Commission is not a, I think this was Hudson Taylor said this. The Great Commission is not a suggestion to be considered, but a command to be obeyed. 
these guys were fervent. They were just fervent. And there was a little turnover. We saw, what, we had about seven eventually. About four at a time would be there. Some of them went back to the Philippines. But our church was made up of that. We had uh, a girl from South Korea that she came, and she got known as being uh, one who witnessed about Jesus to about everybody. And so she had to leave the country like we did every 90 days to get our visa renewed, get our passport stamped. So all you got to do is just leave the country, come back. But she, they wouldn't let her back in. And that happened. They, in Morocco, they weren't kicking people out, but there were a few we heard about that they wouldn't let back in. They don't, they're a tourist country. They don't want a bad rep. We don't kick people out of our country, but they wouldn't necessarily let you back in. And so the state of the Moroccan church, let me cover that just quickly. Uh, we were hearing in the, it's the national church, whatever, the underground church, uh, there was a woman there, Mama, I forgot what, Mama Sewell, and the church there in, in Marrakesh is growing. When we were there in 2018, they said that hey, they had 11 baptisms one night, and our friend that had been in Morocco for 17 years said, I'd never heard of 11 baptisms in 17 years. And that was followed up by another time. They had eight more and, and more. And finally, this Mama Suel was coming under persecution. And she was getting, the, the police were harassing her. Neighbors were harassing her. And finally, the Lord, she wanted to get out. Finally, the Lord said, no, you stay there. I'll bring them to you. And suddenly, people start coming to her door, knocking on the door, wanting to know about Jesus. There's an there's a underground movement. I think if all of the Christians in Morocco would get together with one voice, there would be a loud roar. But they're all afraid. In 2010, about 200 missionaries were given 48 hours to get out of the country. And, and somebody turned uh, the Moroccan national church leaders in, too, and nobody knows who it was. So they don't, they, they're fearful of each other. They don't trust each other. We knew a couple that they, they go and they take testimonies of Muslims that have turned to Jesus, and they, they publish them and send them out all over the country. And they said that we moved to a new town. We thought there were no Christians there. Finally, about... Three or four months later, a guy told us, no, there's 200 Christians here in this town. He says, and there's 200 churches because nobody will associate with each other. They're all a church into themselves. They're afraid of each other. So if you want to pray for Morocco, pray the spirit of fear be broken over the, the local believers and over the workers that are there in town. We met some incredible people. There's a young girl named Hind, and uh, she came to a worship practice time with one of our friends from Ghana, one of the students from Ghana. And just in that practice time, her heart was just, you could tell something happened to her heart. She would walk around. Her, get this, her dad and her brothers are very devout Muslims, very devout Muslims. And she's walking around the house humming, what a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is. And our friend Prince says, you've got to be careful, you know, in your home. Well, what you're saying, what you're doing. But, you know, folks, I can't, I can't imagine being in heaven without her. I just, I want her to be there. The Moroccan people were so kind. They were so sweet. They were so hospitable. We met people out on, just in a restaurant, and they would say, come to our house. We'll, we'll, we'll feed you. Muhammad, the, the leather salesman, I got this, uh, this bag from him. He had us over once. And, uh, you know, we just met him in the store. He had us over. To, they fed us and fed us and fed us fed us. <laughs> we talked. Anita wanted to go over uh, when they sacrificed the sheep because once a, once a year on the big holiday Eid that just happened, every family is supposed to sacrifice a sheep. And she wanted to go so basically because you wanted to see what, how gruesome it is and understanding Jesus' death on the cross. You know, having some picture. And, and uh, we were going to go but then all of a sudden they decided to celebrate at his mother-in-law's house. And he said, I don't have a right to ask you to my mother-in-law's house. So we weren't able to go. But uh, there's so many people, they're God seekers, they just don't know how to find them. There was a girl named Hula, we met in a taxi, and uh, she heard that we spoke English, and, and she wanted to learn English, so she said, can I come to your apartment? We said, sure. So she comes up, the first time she's up there, she's talking real quick, she says, I'm a Muslim, I read the Koran, I don't believe it's true, but I can't call myself an atheist because I still believe in God. And then her mother calls, and she's got to leave, and that's our conversation. It's over. We're like, oh. Well, four to five, six months later, she just shows up again. She comes up there, and she sits down, and she sees my Bible. Is this the Bible? 
can I touch it? And she's just, and she, she's just asking me. I said, you know, I started explaining the gospel to her, and I said, do you know what? You can know that your sins are forgiven before you die. And she was just staring at me, and she said, that's nice. You know what that says? That's gospel. That's good news. That's nice. That's what she was saying. That's good news. Because they don't have a hope. They don't have a hope other than maybe Allah is having a good day and they die and he says, okay, I think your good deeds are better than your bad deeds and come in, you know, I don't have a headache today, so you're okay. They really don't have a hope. And so we met him. Uh, there's a man that I met that he came to Jesus, a, a Moroccan Muslim man. He came to Jesus and said his brother-in-law was a Christian, started witnessing to him. And he had dreams three nights in a row, Jesus speaking to him and says, you have enif enough information, now you decide. He said the same thing three nights in a row. You have enough information, now you decide. And the guy gave his life to Jesus. We had a, one lady that we, we knew of, she, uh, she had a dream. And in her dream, Muhammad appeared to her and said, I'm a fake. <laughs> that got her searching for Jesus. That got her searching the scriptures. There was another one that she had a dream, and in the, in the dream she saw this, this, she was in this big house, and in this one room were all these people, and they were people of the Bible, and they were just enjoying themselves and stuff, but she couldn't go in there. She couldn't go in there, but they just looked like they were so, and, and so that got her seeking the Lord. There's a lot of people that have had dreams and visions. You know, it, it really is the man in white. A lot of them have seen the man in white. And for the, for the local church, that can mean uh, harassment. It can mean arrest. But like I say, we had, there was a couple that visited our church, and then they visited the Catholic church, and then they got arrested for going to church. And uh, they were in the national newspaper. In fact, you could read it on Morocco World News. You know, you, we were there for a few weeks, and I thought, we're going to make the international news. You know? And uh, so they arrested them. They took them in. They only held them for an hour. They questioned them, and they just released them. And then a government official comes on and said, they shouldn't be arrested. They have a right to go to church. So nobody in Morocco knows what's... One judge ruled, somebody gave someone a Bible and said, that's evangelism, you can't come back in the country. Another judge ruled, they gave him a, a Bible and they said, well, the Bible's mentioned in the Koran, the Torah and the Injil. The, the Torah is the Old Testament, Injil, New Testament. And he, he said, so, that's okay. So Morocco's in this place, they don't know where they're at. It just depends on who's the government official at that time. So, I should probably quit. <laughs> There's so many things I'd like to say. Uh, they get harassed, arrested. Uh, we had the one couple that's showing the testimonies around the country now of Muslims that have become Christians. They said our worst fear was getting arrested. He says, we got arrested. They slapped us around a little bit. He said, ah, no, no big deal. They got over their fear. And, you know, I had my moment of truth. Any of you ever think, I wonder what I would do if someone comes and says, will you deny Jesus? Or you, you know. So I'm up in our apartment. We get a knock at the door, and I open the door. There's six policemen outside of my door. I'm thinking, oh, here it is. Ed. What are you going to say? I had told people, I told people when we left, I said, don't pray that I uh, am safe as much as pray that I am faithful. I want to be faithful. I want to be safe. Don't get me wrong. I want to be safe, but I want to be faithful. So they're at the door, and they're just talking away. And I go, English? They all huddle up, and then like the Keystone cops, they run down the steps and disappear. and never see them again. And I found out later that a cop came later, and our building was known for prostitution. Uh, the door was open all night long. People, the apartment between us and this French couple up on the top floor, there were people in and out of it all night long. Uh, our, our landlord told us that Marrakesh is the second worst prostitution city in the world next to Bangkok, Thailand. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it definitely has a reputation. And so what was happening there is we had gotten together with our friend. She's another American, and we were praying in our apartment, and one day she just prays, says, Lord, I just pray that this prostitution in this building stop. Well, our French couple there said they've been trying to get that taken care of for 14 years. Well, Within about a week of that time, there was a sting in our building, and they arrested 13 people, cleaned the place out. They started locking the door downstairs, which, you know, 
we weren't there to be safe. We were there to be witnesses. And so we didn't even think, yeah, the door's open all night long. You know, I, but I want to say this. There's a, a few things. You know, we, you, I don't know where you think you're at in your own personal life and where you think you, what you've got to give to the Lord. And you might think there's not a whole lot. Well, I tell you, remember the story about Knoxville? I didn't really have anything. I just, I'm a normal person. I'm not a super saint. I'm not anything like that. He can take whatever you got. There's, a, there's, there's three short statements I just want to say in closing that are really impactful to me in the Bible. One is when they were feeding the, I think the 5,000, maybe the 4,000. Anyway, they had five fish and whatever. And Jesus said, they said what are we going to do? And they said, he said, bring them here to me. You know, that's a powerful statement. Whatever you have, Bring it here to Jesus. And that goes with this surrender prayer that I pray. You can do that in that prayer. Lord, I'll, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll say anything you want me to say to anyone you want me to say it. You can get that, bring it here to me. Bring them here to me. And what did Jesus do with that? He fed multitudes. And there's a couple of statements by Mary. I know when I say Mary, some people, oh, I'm not Catholic. I'm not either, but it's in the Bible. And she said something that really rings so true she said and I, some of you met Harrison my friend Harrison years ago he, he, he would say this a lot he said what Mary said at the wedding of Canaan Cana uh, really plays into our hearts in every situation she said whatever he says to you do it Amen. you know so when I get that leap in my heart I may want, you know, I got grandkids here. I got nine grandkids. You think I just want to go and leave the grandkids and go to Morocco? But what are we going to use as excuses? You know, it, it really helped me. As we were praying and being sent out, there was a guy came up behind, and I was like, my daughter just said, well, who's going to bring flowers to Quincy on her birthday? And who's going to, you know, this? and I was like, ah. There's a guy who came up behind us, he's praying for us, and he says, you know what, Ed, I'm going to pray for you. And he says, your grandchildren, it'll be a much greater heritage that they say, my grandpa went to Morocco to witness to people about Jesus. Amen. Then they bought me flowers at my birthday. Amen. So what is it we're leaving behind, and what are our excuses? There's always been excuses why not to do it, but whatever he says to you, Whatever he says to you, do it. Do it. And the other thing Mary said was, when the angel came to her, she said, be it unto me according to your word. Whatever the word of God says. I don't, you know, I've battled, I'm almost 68. One month from today, I'll be 68. And, you know, it's taken me this long, I think, just in the last couple months where I, any of you say bad things about yourself in your mind? Oh, you're such a, oh, you don't, you just fall short in this. And you're, you ever, you ever accuse yourself? You, most of your thoughts are bad. I've, I've just, about yourself. I heard somebody say, we, we can't afford to think anything about ourselves that God doesn't think. So what I started doing this time is I just, I'm just going, you know, I, I remembered in Ezekiel 36 that God says of Israel, I'm going to bring you back into the land. And it's not because of you. You've profaned my name in the nations. I'm doing it this for my own namesake. And he tells them that several times. And so I started thinking, I'm Israel. <laughs> I'm just Israel. If he wants to bless me, it's not because of me. It's not because of all the great things that I have done. It's for his own namesake. He wants to show that he's full of mercy. He wants to show that he has some compassion upon the weak and lowly people of the earth. And, you know, so... Be it unto me according to your word. I just started saying, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And it comes up, whatever, I, whatever comes up now, I just say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Sometimes I don't need to understand the depths of that. i just like, oh, I don't care. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. As I'm getting all these accusations in my mind about what a jerk I am and how I've failed and how I've just come up so short and how, you know, I just rehearse it. Any, any of you rehearse those things? Anybody? Nobody? Couple? I mean, I've done that, and it's taken me this long. It's a shame. Maybe that's why I live to this long. 
to finally get that one thing right. So I just want to leave that with you today. Uh, Whatever he says to you, do it. Be it unto me according to his word. And bring it here to me. Whatever you got, bring it to Jesus. Just give him what you got. You might not think it's much. All kinds of ministries can happen. The, The internet thing we heard about this morning, all kinds of stuff like that can happen. But it takes that stepping out. And when, you, when your heart is burning within you because he's speaking to you, our heart burns within us while he is speaking to me, he still does that. Our hearts still burn within us while he is speaking to us. So, Father, we have a lot of wonderful people here. But, Lord, we know that we're not here just because of our wonderfulness, Lord, it's because your namesake, Lord, because you are a God of mercy. You've had compassion upon us, Lord, that you did pay the price that no one else could pay, and you, you were willing, Lord, to sacrifice yourself, the only one in history, the only one in human history who qualified as a sacrifice from sin, for sin. And, Lord, if you would have refused, we had no hope, but you didn't refuse. And so, Lord, you deserve the glory and the honor you deserve riches and wisdom and wealth. Lord, you, you deserve everything, Lord. You deserve our lives. You deserve to have a people for your own possession, zealous for good deeds. You deserve that, Lord. And so, Lord, help us to see you in some way like Isaiah did so that we'll say, I don't care where it is. Send me. I'll go. Whether it's our neighbor or whether it's Morocco or whether it's Sudan. Lord, we'll go. That doesn't mean we want to go, Lord, but whatever you say, Lord, we, we, our, our minds can rest in you because we trust in you. Lord, bring us to that place, like I prayed to start. Bring us to that place where we just grow in trust for you. We love you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.